Hello, and welcome to Great.com Talks With. Today, we're talking with Dr. Sterling Burnett, Senior Fellow and Managing Editor of Environment and Climate News at Heartland Institute, an organization whose mission is to discover, develop, and promote free market solutions to social and economic problems. And if you're new to our podcast, please press subscribe button either on YouTube or your podcast app, because today we're going to learn about an organization that is fighting for more individual liberty and smaller government. Hello, Dr. Sterling Burnett. Welcome to Great.com Talks. We're excited to have you here. Thanks for having me on. I'm excited to be on and uh, reach new audiences. Wonderful. Could you please describe um, the work that you do at Heartland Institute for someone who is not familiar with your work? My work in particular or Heartland Institute's work in general? Heartland Institute. Yes, the Heartland Institute is based in, uh, used to be in Chicago, Illinois. We've been around for 37 years. We're a nonprofit uh, educational organization. We don't do lobbying. Uh, we uh, work on promoting, discovering and promoting uh, market solutions to difficult social and economic problems. Uh, we focus most of our work on uh, domestic issues, mm-hmm. but uh, because international policy can affect domestic policy and domestic policy can affect international policy, we do a modicum of uh, work on international issues. Uh, most of our work is on economic issues. We cover a range of topics. I happen to work on environment, energy, and climate issues, but we have people in our organization that work on health care, that work on budget, budget and tax issues. We work on uh, big tech, uh, uh, information technology, uh, property issues. Um, uh, we, we stay mostly away from the social controversial social issues. Uh, if it's got an economic take, then we then we work on it. Uh, we are unique uh, with some organizations in the United States. Uh, I can't speak to how organizations internationally work, but um, we are based in Illinois, not in Washington, D.C. And so we do deal with national issues, but we also have a strong presence in all 50 states. So we have a government relations portion of our organization that interacts with state legislators and state agencies on a regular basis. So we testify all around the country, both written and in person. We have thousands of contacts every year with state legislators. We have 300 state legislators that actually pay to um, to get uh, to, to be a part of what I call, we call our legislative forum. So they come to events and um, we uh, we basically critique a proposed legislation and, and existing legislation and propose, uh, if we think it's pretty good, we might propose improvements. If we think it's bad, we might say, here's an alternative. Uh, so that's... Um, I guess a general overview. We have about 7,000 donors. Um, uh, More than 70% of them are individuals. Uh, We get about 22% of our income from um, foundations, grant-making foundations. And then we have a small uh, percent from uh, corporations, but nobody provides more than 5% of our uh, revenue. Mm-hmm. Yeah, indeed. You mentioned the range of um, and the scope of work um, and the topics that you work on researching and educating both public and policymakers is uh, quite um, extensive, including uh, healthcare, climate, as well as all the economic um, problems that may encounter. And you indeed um, critique and suggest solutions and work closely uh, with policymakers to make a change for a better uh, economic situation, both um, in, uh, na- in on a national level as well as international level. As you mentioned, they can be um, interrelated. Uh, Right. As your organization um, is focusing on free market uh, solutions, could you please uh, describe the free market economy and the impact of it on the solving social and economic problems? Well, what's interesting is uh, even Karl Marx, you know, who uh, is known as the father of communism, he recognized the virtues of the market. Um, he said, before we can reach the communist stage, we have to have the market stage. You know, he, he believed in sort of this historical development uh, that was inevitable. Now, I, I don't happen to agree with his analysis of history being inevitable and 
uh, markets being a stage. But he did recognize that uh, markets make societies wealthy. They produce goods and services uniquely well, um, satisfying people's desires. And uh, so we think that uh, people should have freedom, that, that they have a right to uh, autonomy, to deciding for themselves how they ought to live, and that markets provide the uh, wealth and goods and services better than other forms of uh, economic development uh, to satisfy people's uh, myriad choices. You know, we don't live the same way. We don't want the same things. And uh, the idea that there's some elite that knows best how everybody ought to live, that we all have to live one way, and there's somebody that actually knows what that one way is, uh, we just don't believe that. Mm-hmm. Mm, yes, uh, as you mentioned, uh, capital, uh, capitalism and free market economy is about the choice. Um, so um, uh, in this uh, market, in this economy, everyone is supposed to, to have um, their own choice and fight their own choice and have the limited options rather than, um, as mentioned by you, a certain individual or a light group deciding for the whole economy, for the whole country or society on the uh, choices, on the uh, actions, on the activities they are supposed to have. So there are... um, Well, Well, and it also turns out that freedom of this type... um, makes societies wealthier, faster uh, than any other economic system. Mm -hmm. And uh, wealth means, uh, in general, longer lives, less infant mortality, uh, in general, better nutrition, fewer people um, uh, going hungry. Uh, Basically, it turns out that market economies make life better for most people than they would have been absent the market. And you can do cross cultural comparisons, cross country comparisons of what it was, what it is or, or uh, was like behind former iron country, uh, iron curtain countries. Uh, you can, you can compare their environments to uh, uh, Western environments. You can compare uh, their standards of living and their uh lifespans, their levels of infant mortality. Uh, and so basically, uh, markets allow people to exercise their freedom better. And in the process, it also, um, development makes people's lives uh, better. Mm-hmm. Mm, certainly, there's not as um, there are several indicator of wealth as uh, mentioned by you. It's not only about the money; it's about the freedom, it's about sure. life, uh, expectancy, about the quality of life, quality of food. And we can see that although um, United States might be a young country, three hundred years, less than three hundred years, but with this free economy, it was able to become one of the uh, wealthiest nation as well as uh, one of the leading nations, and it uh, indicates. Well, you know, education, uh, you, 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 you can look at, at education levels. You can look at um, uh, female empowerment in, in countries that have markets versus countries that are more closed. Um, uh, you know, there's no there's no society or country that doesn't have problems. There's no question about that. As I'm long sorry. as, you know, as, as long as human beings are <laughs> as opposed to robots or some kind of perfect being. Um, every society will have problems. Uh, there's always room for improvement, but it turns out in general, uh, Western, well, I say Western, but that's just because they happen to be the ones that adopted market economies had, uh, Eastern societies adopted markets, uh, earlier had they had, uh, enforceable property rights earlier for private individuals. Um, they, they would be uh, where we are probably or ahead. And in fact, uh, as they, <laughs> As they uh, allow markets and property rights, they're seeing massive development, right? So, mm-hmm. yes, indeed. Um, and um, Harland Institute uh, plays an essential role in the movement for personal liberty and limited government. Could you please tell us about this uh, movement and why having a limited government is important for personal liberty? 
Well, um, <laughs> government is force. Government is um, it, it, the it, it claims for itself the, the exclusive right to the use of legitimate force within a geographic region. That's what government is. It be it the Dallas city government, uh, the Texas government. You know, I happen to be in Texas and in Dallas or a suburb of, or the United States government. Uh, within its borders, it claims the right to adjudicate disputes um, and to lay down laws that people should follow and to police those laws. But it's not, in general, voluntary. You don't, you don't get to uh, pick and choose which laws you, um, you obey. And so government is force. And the, the greater the government, the larger the government, the less scope for individual freedom and action and choice. You know, every law restricts something. Mm -hmm. Every regulation tells somebody what they can or cannot do in one way or the other. So the larger the government, the more laws, the more regulations, the less scope of free action for individuals. Mm -hmm. Mm. And so um, if it so happens, market economies uh, have a, a larger range of choice for individuals. What, what markets do is free exchange. I, um, I want something and I go out and I convince somebody to give me that something, whether it's for money, for trade, for labor, uh, you know, for whatever it is. What I don't get to do, however, is I want something and I get to take a gun and or a knife or say and say, give this to me or else. Nor do I get to uh, force someone to do something for me in a market economy. I get to persuade them or entice them through money or trade or whatever else. Uh, government, when it wants something. You know, it can entice, but quite often what it does is it takes from one group of people and gives to another group of people to encourage it. Or it just says, we want you to do this. And so we're outlawing anything but this. That's not freedom. That's government is not persuasion. It is force. Mm -hmm. The IRS doesn't ask whether you want to pay your taxes. It says pay your taxes or else. Mm -hmm. um, and. There may be a realm, you know, a justification for that force to keep order to 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 um, for people who may want to take advantage of other people and use force on them to protect you from them. But the, like I said, the larger the realm of government action, the greater intervention in people's lives, telling them what they can or can't do, what they can or can't make, what they can or can't buy or sell, how they can or cannot use their property. Every new rule or regulation restricts somebody's freedom. Mm -hmm. mm, that's quite an interesting analogy that having a limited government uh, will enable uh, more people to exercise their rights, to exercise their freedom, as long as it's in the scope of um, not um, violence, as long uh, as it's not in the scope of uh, pressuring someone and just uh, making sure the peace is there. And if it's to that extent, uh, you can exercise your uh, rights and you can exercise your freedom without hurting someone or without harming them, without taking away uh, someone else's uh, life. And um, as uh, we discussed earlier that you work closely uh, with um, state electoral officials uh, in 2018 survey done, um, 45% of state elected officials said that Heartland publication influenced their opinions or led to a change in public policy. Could you please tell us um, more in detail how you work uh, with state elected officials and how you inform them about the public view on uh, policies yeah. that they are proposing? Well, I mean, uh, we, we do it through a variety of ways. We examine particular states' uh, proposed laws and regulations on a range of issues, and we do analyses of these. Uh, the economic impact, the impact on people's freedom of choice, uh, whether it will create or destroy jobs, whether it's just a wealth transfer. So, um, if you if you pass a law that says you will use this type of energy and not that type of energy, 
basically what happens is you're transferring wealth from one group of politically connected people to the people that existed beforehand. Um, how do we communicate with them? Well, we have a government relations staff that uh, is in constant communication, uh, both on the phone and through email, uh, you know, increasingly common e- email, texting, whatever. Uh, we also provide, we also uh, publish newspapers mm-hmm. that go to every uh, state legislator. There's a reason why we, we you know, uh, I think 80%, the same poll showed over 80% at least uh, have read our newspapers. Forty percent have actually been persuaded by something we've we've written in our newspapers to have changed their mind. That's pretty impactful, I think. Um, there are organizations in all fifty states, I believe that's the case, who fight for free markets in within that state. So uh, in Texas, we have something called the Texas Public Policy Foundation. Um, in uh, Louisiana, they have the Pelican Institute, just just as examples. So, but they focus just on that state. We cover fifty states, mm-hmm. and we cover the federal government. Now, it's hard to do. We've got a limited budget. We've got limited staff, but we do it, and we do it pretty well. Um, it's not the case that we cover every law or every regulation. We have limited our scope to largely economic. Um, uh, like I said, we stay away from sort of controversial social issues. Uh, that's not our expertise. Mm-hmm. Um, and um, even among the economic, you know, we can only cover so many issues. My my particular realm of uh, of uh, expertise and experience is environment, but environment is a huge. Um, uh, realm, mm-hmm. you know, there's, there's clean air, there's clean water, there's solid waste, there's species, there's land issues, public land issues, state private land issues. There is climate change. There is energy development in use. Uh, there are, you know, so there's mining, there's, uh, um, uh, wind and solar development. So there are a lot of things that, uh, technically fall within my um expertise well my realm of expertise but it's not the case that i can cover all of them all the time Mm -hmm. there are some people that specialize in clean air issues they really know that issue Mm -hmm. i can't say that i really really know that issue but i know the people who do know that issue so i consult with them when i'm going to work on a topic and that's one one thing we do is we write news stories and we go to experts. We say, what is your take on this law, this proposed law, the existing law? What, you know, is it doing good? Is it doing bad? I don't know that, but they know that. Mm-hmm. And so we we have, I think the we have over 500 policy advisors, people that we go to for quotes on stories, for for guidance on issues. Uh, in academia, in government, in the private sector. Mm-hmm. Yeah, um, essentially, you are a bridge uh, between uh, policy experts and public opinion and the policymakers. So you um, analyze, uh, consult uh, with experts and make publications, uh, write news about them. And essentially, 80% of uh, state elected officials uh, read them and 45% make decisions based on uh, what uh, they have read uh, on uh, Heartland uh, Institute publications. And you are actually an action tank as well as a think tank. And uh, uh, could you please tell us about a recent work, especially in your area of expertise? um, That well, uh, yeah. Well, before um, before COVID hit, you you know, last last year, uh, things were different. (laughs) Certainly in the United States, I assume where you're you're at as well. Uh, To some extent. Uh, everything became virtual. Mm-hmm. Um, but two years ago, the year before COVID, um, I testified in Congress about laws uh, concerning uh, uh, whether we should be testing or um, uh, doing surveys of oil and gas offshore and what its impact might be on whales. Mm-hmm. Um, 
we have promoted, it's not in my area of expertise, but we're promoting a uh, market-oriented health plan proposal to um, uh, to replace uh, the government plan that came about during the Obama administration, to, but, but because it would improve upon it, not because we don't think people should have health care, but because we think there are better ways to provide people health care and better health care, uh, ways which, in fact, um, uh, remove layers of bureaucracy between them and health care providers so they can make more informed choices as opposed to insurers or government making choices for them. Mm -hmm. Wow, your testimony in Congress, it sure helped, um, I assume, policymakers in making a, a better decision for the environment, as well as the um, finding a better way of um, testing. And, uh, and I believe your contribution uh, was essential in that uh, particular uh, matter. If someone would like to support Heartland Institute, how can they do that? Well, they go to www.heartland.org and uh, sign up uh, under support. Go find out about us. Uh, sign up for one of our newsletters or newspapers. They're free online. And if you want the print edition, uh, it's a minimal subscription for the newspapers. Uh, not everything we publish is, is print, uh, but I publish three times a month generally something called Climate Change Weekly. Uh, it's, it's called weekly, but I, I can't do it for four weeks a month. Uh, so, um, you know, th th three weeks a month, I publish uh, something called Climate Change Weekly that's online only. Uh, you can either view it on our website or you can actually have it sent to you. Just sign up for it. Um, but we have a variety of publications like that. And uh, we encourage people to go there. Uh, listen to our podcast. We have podcasts daily. Uh, we have, uh, gosh, I don't know how many podcasts um, we have done over the years. I personally have done 320 podcasts since I've been here. And that's one person in one small area, uh, you know, the environment, not a small area, but on the environmental issues. But we also have people doing podcasts on healthcare, on law. On we we now have a, a book series of podcasts where we have a person who weekly talks to a fan, an author of a recent book uh, that may not be policy oriented could be history. Um, so uh, and we have I think we have uh, an audience of well I don't want to lie but I think it's a couple hundred thousand a month listen to our podcast. Mm -hmm. Uh, it may be it may be over three hundred thousand a month. Um, so million millions of people every year listen to our podcast. Mm -hmm. um, the link to the Heartland Institute website will be provided in the description. So you viewing and listening can go to the website and familiarize yourself with more um, uh, more with the work that Heartland Institute as well as the um, Sterling and his team are doing. Thank you so much, Sterling. It was wonderful to get to know you and the great work uh, Heartland Institute is doing. Well, thanks for having me on. And uh, please, uh, if not me, keep, keep us in mind if you ever need someone else to talk about a particular issue. Mm -hmm. For you listening, if you enjoyed this conversation, please press like and share button because this will show the YouTube algorithm and podcast algorithm that this conversation is important, that free market solutions can be an important tool for solving social and economic problems. Thank you and see you in the next episode.